Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session on transforming, transforming Medicaid in North Carolina for behavioral health and intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, I'd like to introduce the panelists and introduce you to our session today. My name is Doug Golub. I am the moderator, and I am from Metasked. And here are our panelists. My name is Deb Goda. I'm the Associate Director for NC Medicaid in North Carolina. I'm Cindy Ehlers, Chief Operations Officer from Trillium Health Resources. I am Melissa Hall. I'm the Executive Vice President, Chief Operating Officer for Behavioral Health Services with Monarch. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and I'm Doug Golub uh, from Metasked. Um, so for today's session, North Carolina is undergoing a major Medicaid transformation to manage care and emphasizing whole person care and aligning with the federal health home state plan options. Uh, the tailored plan, uh, as we call it, uh, will serve as an integrated health plan for individuals with significant behavioral health needs and intellectual and developmental disabilities, IDD. And during this session, we'll be taking a look at some major areas towards this transformation um, from the experts who are here right now as the transformation is taking place. Um, so uh, this is the transformation and the only diagram we'll be using today. Uh, the rest of it will be explaining what's actually happening every single day during this transformation. North Carolina will launch the North Carolina Medicaid Managed Care Behavioral Health and Intellectual Developmental Disabilities Tailored Plan on December 1st, 2022. This plan is an integrated health plan for individuals with significant behavioral health needs and intellectual and developmental, developmental disabilities. The Behavioral Health IDD Tailored Plan will also serve other special populations, including uh, the Innovations and Traumatic Brain Injury Waiver enrollees, uh, and waitlist members, and it's also responsible for managing the state's non-Medicaid behavioral health, developmental disabilities, and traumatic brain injury services for uninsured and underinsured North Carolinians. Um, so today we'll talk about background on the transformation, and this panel will be looking at three different areas uh, for discussion today. Um, the first is based around local provider-based care management and a glide path over the next four years uh, towards tailored plan implementation. The second area we'll be discussing uh, is related to the state's social determinants of health uh, screening and healthy opportunities Medicaid funded pilot uh, for evidence-based non-medical interventions related to social determinants of health. And finally, population health data to improve the lives of North Carolinians. And so as we begin by talking about uh, the local provider-based care management with a glide path over the next four years. We also talk about building a robust, uh, building robust care management with a growth pattern over time. And so this is a diagram from uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, which is where Deb is from. And it talks about how over the last several years, uh, DHHS has been involved with stakeholders uh, like the local management entities that will become the tailored plans uh, which is where Cindy is from, and the care management agencies and also the home and community-based providers uh, like Monarch, which is where Melissa is from. Uh, and so the tailored plan um, using the health home model uh, really has three different potential approaches uh, that are done across the state and across regions to best meet the needs of North Carolinians. The first is called an advanced medical home plus or an AMH plus a primary or a primary care practice. The second approach is a care management agency, um, which is where Melissa is from. Um, and uh, these are organizations eligible for certification by the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, um, providing behavioral health uh, IDD services. And the third is a tailor plan, uh, is the tailor, tailor plan based care manager, which is where Cindy is from, Trillium Health Resources. Um, and so individuals have choice uh, as to which approach they take over the course of the next four years. Um, year one is the go live where the tailored plans uh, like Trillium Health Resources will uh, have the lion's share of the individuals because they have the care managers today. Over the course of time as capacity is built, this is where we start to see additional AMH pluses and CMAs taking on more and more of the role over that four year glide path. 
And so to explain what we're all getting ready for on December 1st of this year and each of the years to follow over the course of the glide path. Uh, and we begin uh, with, with this panel um, and our first topic. And with that, um, we'll begin with Deb providing some context behind the glide path uh, from the point of view of the Department of Health and Human Services as we build this robust capacity. Thank you so much, Doug. So as Doug mentioned, there will be a glide path um, along which we will move uh, in subsequent years, having more and more individuals that are involved in a community-based care management versus a plan-based care management. But we understand that it is going to take time for the tailored plans to build up their care management networks and that community capacity. So to that end, there have been capacity building funds uh, to the LMEMCOs, um, the tailored plans to be. And they are utilizing those funds to build their networks. Um, prior to uh, 2012, uh, when we moved into managed care statewide, uh, past our initial pilot for behavioral health, prior to that date, care management, uh, case management was done by private provider agencies. When we moved into managed care, the LME MCOs began providing care coordination as an administrative function and treatment planning was part of that. So our case management agencies moved on to providing other services. Now, as we move into a more community-based approach, the tailored plans are gonna to have to build the communities back up. So currently we have 42 agencies that are prepared to provide um, care management. Uh, one AMH plus, or seven, sorry, AMH pluses and 40 case management agencies. Um, 34 of those are from the first round of applications and 13 from the second round of applications. And the next round of applications will begin in October. So with this in mind, the onus of the care management will be provided by the tailored plan in year one. In year two, we expect that there will be additional rounds for AMH pluses and care ma management agencies. So that can build up over time so that after four years after implementation, the tailored plan would be providing the least amount of services in the care management space. Perfect. And Cindy is in the middle of going through readiness with you right now uh, as this is being recorded. So, so thank you, Cindy, for joining us. Um, tell us about, you can probably uh, have it pretty fresh. Tell us about uh, some of the capacity building that's been going on um, even since 2012 and some of the activities at Trillium. Sure, so um, Trillium is working with our providers uh, who have passed certification. We, we have set up what we call a provider success team. Uh, that's a team that is a cross-functional team working with everything from health IT across the, the spectrum to population health, uh, data analytics and quality management uh, structure. Th this provider success team is focused on uh, helping providers have a holistic approach uh, to this new business line. Uh, ultimately, uh, as they go into care management agency or advanced medical home plus, uh, starting out, providers won't have any risk involved uh, the plan-based care management currently carries all of the risk financially for uh, member care. And so we're going to want to have a very strong partnership, uh, making sure that providers are addressing the population health needs of all of our members. Uh, here at Trillium, we'll have around 41,000 uh, members starting out. Um, there's a focus on whole person care. We, we've been doing a behavioral health carve-out, an IDD carve-out, for about the last decade here in North Carolina, now we're pivoting to this whole person care, managed care approach. Um, it is following along the health home model. 
So this care management includes things like comprehensive care management. There's an assessment that goes with that and a care needs screening that really helps us point out all those, the social determinants of health that our members face. Uh, obviously a care coordination component, linking members and coordinating their care uh, across many facets of service delivery uh, and community integration. Health promotion, where we're really looking at the diseases that people get and trying to uh, focus on uh, and incentivize folks to uh, lead healthier lives through that health promotion uh, aspect. Uh, obviously, as we think about these populations, we're going to try to make sure that we're helping bridge every transition through care management uh, across their lifespan, uh, in and out of different levels of care, and making sure that people have really good comprehensive follow-up from that care. Uh, for example, if someone's in the hospital and they're coming uh, back home, making sure that all the pieces are in place for them to have a healthy and successful transition back home from hospital stay, regardless of what the reason was, right? Um, <clears throat> this is a very uh, member-focused and family-oriented support service uh, and is very connected, uh, as I mentioned, for social determinants for health, but also just in community integration uh, as a whole. Uh, so we're really excited about this. We're excited about our provider partners who are, are the early adopters out there trying to, to be part of the beginning of care management. Really excited about the advanced medical homes plus in our area uh, who are taking on this sort of new endeavor uh, to really make sure they have good integrated care uh, for this, these populations. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Cindy. Um, and one of those partners is Melissa Hall an executive vice president um, and chief operating officer for behavioral services at Monarch, uh, working directly with, um, with Cindy and with several other uh, of, the, of the tailored plans. Uh, and of course, with North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Um, so Melissa, can you tell us about how you're preparing to become a CMA? Sure, thanks Doug. Well, we started our journey back in 2018 when we were granted a CCVAC by SAMHSA, and it was a three-year grant, um, and it really kind of set the tone for us as an agency. Uh, we, had, we hired targeted case managers as part of that CCVAC, along with other things, um, but those, case, those targeted care managers uh, work with individuals diagnosed with mental illness, and their approach was really closing that gap. Um, and barriers using those social determinants of health and supporting the coordination of care. And there were five of them we had on our teams. They instituted daily huddles every day. They work with the different providers and the therapists and the school systems and other community and, and had those community connections throughout the, the county that, that was serving the CCBAC. Um, and over the course of that three year grant, they were able to provide coordination of care to over 1000 individuals and those interventions included money management, self-care, exercise, nutrition, edu education, personal safety, transportation, housing, access to medications, and connections to those community, community resources, just to name a few things. And then that really set the tone for um, fast forward to December of uh, 2020. And Monarch, Monarch that, at that point was selected to do a pilot in our Raleigh area with a managed care organization. Um, so we won that and we were really excited about that. Um, and we launched that, that pilot for care management in March of 2021. And it was a team-based uh, care that was the focus of the team. And the current team consists of three care managers and it, we also added a peer support specialist to the team. Really thought that having that on the team in talking with the MCO that was running the pilot, that that would really be an advantage. And we proved, we proved right with that. Um, and they work with both internal and our external providers. Um, and in this pilot, the MCOs gives us the names of people that we're currently serving and that we've added care management to and added, and added caseloads um, with that. This pilot is important to note that this pilot did not serve any children and we did not serve anyone with IDD or uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, in our first cohort, we started in March, we received 50 names. And then from March to November, 
we ended up having six cohorts as a result of that. And um, the majority of individuals, they wanted the service, but we also found some people that opted out. And we had a total so to date so far of 84 people that have opted out of the service. Um, and we're currently now actively engaging with about 95 individuals that are character character characterized in acuity of high, moderate, and low, most of which are high acuity using the risk stratification that the MCO gave us. Um, and they, we engaging with them with phone calls, text, you know, face-to-face, -face, um, text and emails. And one of the things that we found that we're in, when, it's, when we're engaging with folks, it's really important to know that person. Um, we we want to know when that person gets sick. Do they use the emergency room? Do they use an urgent care? Do they use a primary physician? It's also important that we learn that you know what types of social systems do they use? Do they go to do they use food stamps? Do they go to food banks? Do they go to churches? You know all those social de determinants of health coming into play here. Um, so really found that was really useful. <clears throat> and also um, we also did use uh, their case management software. Um, and that, that was supplied by the MCO and in, in which they, our care manager were doing the developing assessments and developing the care plans along with that, with the individuals. So it's been a really interesting, wonderful process. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Melissa. And that actually leads really nicely into the next topic, which is on social determinants of health. Uh, North Carolina has developed a, a, a social determinant of health screening um, and also the Healthy Opportunities Medicaid funded pilot uh, allowed for evidence-based non-medical interventions related to the social determinants of health. And so social determinants of health as identified by CMS have some core domain areas. Uh, Melissa just hit on several of them from economic stability to education access and quality, healthcare access and quality, neighborhood and built environment, and uh, social and community context. And over the course of the years to come, the, the big picture plan is for providers to help identify uh, these by using Z codes through the ICD-10 codes on, on claims. And across the United States, this is not really um, where, where, where the world wants it to be yet, but it's evolving when it comes to using Z codes to identify social determinants of health. Um, so for example, um, problems related to housing and economic circumstances would be a, in the Z59s, let's say. Um, problems related to uh, psychosocial circumstances, the Z64s. Um, in today's world, I think we've all seen data that show uh, what percentage of claims are coming across with these today, and it's certainly not up to where it needs to be, but uh, every journey begins with the first step, I guess. Uh, and uh, And so, these assessments that are done, the care management tools that are in place help to identify these using uh, EHR data and using um, self-reported data uh, during this period of time until the claims data, if it can tell more of the story. Um, so with that, we have an opportunity to talk about some of these processes and, and the social determinants of health and whole person supports. And we start with Cindy. Um, from Trillium, can you can you describe Cindy the the Healthy Opportunities pilot, the integrations with NC Care 360, what that is, and uh, and how today we're taking some leaps in recognizing, addressing, and supporting outcomes with social determinants of health for the people that we support. Absolutely, Doug. So um, the first thing that that I think I would say is this is an entirely different way of doing this. Uh, than we've ever done in the state of North Carolina. And I think in the country, in terms of this approach uh, that North Carolina has set out, which is extraordinarily ambitious. Uh, it started with getting funding uh, for some pilot sites uh, for healthy opportunities uh, around the state. Uh, Trillium is fortunate enough <clears throat> to have 17 of, the 20, uh, of our 28 counties involved in uh, healthy opportunities counties. Uh, in, in that that means these members in these counties will have access to a much more robust array of community services paid for by Medicaid than they've ever had historically. And so that's done a couple of things that it has really bolstered and helped to develop 
resources in the areas of food security and housing security. Uh, it has brought about a more profound approach in, at the local community level to addressing uh, the needs of this population than we've ever seen in those counties. And part of that is because those dollars are really targeted toward uh, developing these types of resources uh, for our members uh, in, in these areas. So it's brought jobs, it's brought development, it's brought resources um, that we can, can see that are tangible, uh, that our members are able to access. So that's sort of at a high level, but then North Carolina, really visionary in the thinking around this, uh, developed uh, NC Care 360, which is an engine that allows um, providers like Melissa and her group with Monarch to make a referral uh, into NC Care 360, and it gets tracked all the way through the delivery of, it, let's say it was a referral for housing, it would go in there, the housing referral needs would be met, and then it would become a closed loop referral, uh, really making sure that those types of needs are met. Um, when care managers are linking members, you know, historically you may make a referral for a member, try to link them to a service, and you don't really know if it ever happened, and you may not hear from the member that it didn't. And so this, this process of the NC Care 360 really will make sure that those needs are met and, and that care managers and members are, are all communicating in that process. Um, our role as a health plan, unlike other, like other health plans in this state, um, really is a, a role as a payer in that where we are part of the infrastructure uh, that makes this work um, for our members, we will be um, working with the, the human service organizations uh, and the lead agency to uh, make sure that each and every referral is reimbursed. Uh, this gets to your codes, Doug, in terms of Z codes. They'll, they'll matter a lot in the way we design this here in the state so that we're tracking how many people did we help house, how many people did we help educate, how many people did we um, restore their food security uh, in terms of making these types of of referrals and then getting those needs met and filing claims that that really are able to demonstrate that. Uh, definitely one of the most exciting things I think in my career is to see, uh, we've done a lot of this work uh, as Trillium over many years that we've been in this state, uh, but we haven't been able to track it or demonstrate the evidence that we were doing it the way Healthy Opportunities is gonna let us do that. And certainly we haven't ever had the funding. So I think if this works, it'll be a game changer in the Medicaid system. Definitely, thanks, you mean when, when this works. And uh, <laughs> thanks, Cindy. Um, and on that, uh, Melissa, uh, some, of the, some of the background on, on the individual's experience, what is this like for the individual and specifically these populations, intellectual and developmental disabilities and behavioral health, they're, they're very different. Um, there's some commonality to physical health uh, but many of the social supports, uh, many of the many of the needs. I started my career as a direct support professional twenty something years ago, um, and uh, you know every once in a while I get a chance to kind of go back and 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 volunteer and do some work and 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 uh, a lot's changed, a lot's stayed the same. But these are different populations, um, and what are some of the things that that are happening now in this building process to make sure that people are getting the supports that they want and they need, uh, and um, and and basically walk us through the, the 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 this from the point of view of the individual enrollee. Sure, Doug. So one of the differences is the the state has has outlined the qualifications of the care manager very specifically. Um, for the, one of the common themes is for the care manager themselves that they have to have, of course, a bachelor's degree in human services and at least two years of working experience with that specific population, whether it be uh, behavioral health or the IDD TBI population. And that's, and that's where, and then the path gets a little bit different. So from the behavioral health standpoint, the supervisor um, of the behavioral health would be a licensed person. For example, they would have they would be fully licensed as an LCSW, an LMH, L LCMHC, an LPA, or an LMFT, or an RN, along with three years of experience with that. Um, on a side note, one of the things that we're kind of excited about is hiring RNs 
to be supervisors um, and supervising teams in care management, because that's one thing that we didn't do in the pilot. So we're, we're, we are very excited um, to go down that path with, um, with care management as we expand. And then on the supervisor for the, on the IDD TBI side, you have, it's a bachelor's degree with five years of experience. Um, and then we go into the peer extenders, which is, uh, it can be a certified peer support specialist that's part of the team, um, making sure that they have that lived experience. The state outlined that really, really well and really clearly that that was something that's very important to this, to make, to make this successful. Um, it can be a parent or guardian of an individual who's diagnosed with IDD or TBI, or it can, they can, person can have a behavioral health condition uh, with two years of a direct experience providing care and being able to navigate me Medicaid. Um, in addition to that, we're also thinking of, this is also a great opportunity for us to hire some LPNs as peer extenders. Um, and going back to Cindy's comment, it's Cindy's point with integration and making sure that we have that whole person care, adding that medical component such as the nursing, whether it be an RN or LPN on a team is really, I think gonna be uh, really important to make care management successful in North Carolina. In addition to that, one of the, um, the differences that we're also seeing in North Carolina is that on the behavioral health side is that it's individuals that we as a provider are already providing services to individuals, whether they're getting therapy or, um, or could be a member in our day program, uh, I'm sorry, in a PSR, and we're, we're currently serving them. So we, we'll be getting those folks to, uh, for care management. On the IDD TBI side, however, it's individuals that we don't as an agency currently serve. So providers who currently serve individuals will not be providing care management to those individuals. One of the things that the state really wanted to make sure of is that that, that type of, in, um, that is conflict-free care management. So we're making sure that that happens. Um, geography is also so important when looking at care management, um, being able to access those individuals and when, as we're looking at, you know, the big state playing field of where to put pe people and where we can serve people best. Um, one of the reasons that the pilot was in Wake County is they limited it in Raleigh, in the Raleigh area to that and limiting us to that just the one county, which is a lot um, of, co of coverage when you're serving individuals. Um, it also allows the team to work with more individuals directly. And one of the things that we have as a philosophy is making sure that this care management, the team is not an office job. We have, although the staff will have remote um, home offices, we want people to be in the field serving people. We want our care managers going to the people, not the people coming to our care managers. So we really feel it's important to have that community approach and um, going to see them on a regular basis. Thanks, Doug. Incredible. Thanks, Melissa. Um, and that actually lends really nicely into the next topic, uh, which is population health data to improve the lives of North Carolinians and building those data sets to be able to measure and improve outcomes. And some of the promise uh, that the tailored plan transformation makes possible is aligning the processes to be able to, to measure and improve as the expression goes, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it, or that which cannot be measured cannot be improved. And so certain measures are um, identified by the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Some of these have been proven out through the pilots. Some of these uh, will continue to be pr proven out in the months and years ahead. For example, um, one of the, the heatest measures, health effectiveness data information set um, that are being used uh, here in North Carolina as part of the tailored plan transformation. One example is follow-up after a psychiatric hospitalization, right? And, uh, and, and you can measure that. You can measure that through a combination of, well, the claims data, you know, when there's been a psychiatric hospitalization because there's a claim, uh, plus the EHR data, you, you know, when there's been a follow-up from the care manager, um, and you can measure these. You can measure uh, diabetes management, uh, through the different claims and, and, and care management activities. Uh, and so by looking at these measurements, uh, it's helpful to guide the care management activities towards certain, uh, certain goals and certain initiatives. In North Carolina, we haven't mentioned it yet, uh, but there are um, six uh, tailored plans across the state. Each one is geographically bound. 
So uh, based on the counties, for example, Trillium serves most of the eastern counties of North Carolina. Um, and there are others, and each region is very different. Each county is very different. Uh, and, uh, and so, but for the individual, they, they work with the tailored plan in their county. This is, there's, there's not overlapping, um, which creates some opportunities as well in that the data set is complete uh, at, the, at the tailored plan. You don't have to patch it together from multiple sources, which is really exciting. Um, of those, those HEDIS measures and the other measures that the tailored plans are putting together, Cindy, can you walk us through some of those HEDIS measures, some of the penalties uh, that may be involved and some of the, the opportunity with what we're trying to do? Oh, you're on mute. I'm so sorry you think I'd know that by now, uh, this long in a pandemic. So, so uh, we're definitely looking at a whole battery of HEDIS measures. The one to seven day follow-up is certainly one of those. Recidivism and hospitalization is another. Um, there, there are so many uh, different ones. And, and in fact, um, they do some, some of them do have penalties, although I think most of those will be a soft start on any type of penalty. Um, some can be as much as $5,000 a day. Um, some are more per episode. Um, each of those penalties is really um, a way to make sure that we understand the importance. And so I'm, I'm gonna focus a little bit on this one to seven day metric. It's, it's definitely a measure people know about um, and, and understand and have heard. And, and in fact, it's been around a long time in, in many systems. But I wanna, I wanna just focus a second on, it's not really about just hitting the check the box, right? Making sure that you got the member saw by a provider uh, in that one to seven days and, and you did it, yay. It's really about if a person went to the hospital, right? And, and or a crisis facility, a facility-based crisis setting, and they were, they were unwell, whatever, whatever it was that took them there, whether it's a physical health issue or behavioral health issue, Surely it is important that they're seen after they leave there because people don't just go to the hospital uh, for no reason. There, there was a concern. And that one to seven follow-up, one to seven day follow-up should really be about making sure that they're well connected and engaged in care, not just to avoid costs, which is certainly what managed care gets tagged with, but also to assure care right, to make sure that that person is okay, that they're getting the treatment they need, whatever that may be, and that they're on the path to recovery, whatever that means for them. And so it depended on what the issue was. Um, I, I think that sometimes when we, in systems, talk about these metrics, what we fail to do is really tie them to the care of the person, tie them to the importance of that person's well-being. Um, and we get caught up in measuring things and not really why. Uh, and so I just would, would focus on that. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the big pieces of data that we're all chasing in the state right now is ADT, also known as admission, discharge, and transfer data. Uh, it really centers around people being admitted to the hospital, when they're admitted, uh, when they're discharged, when they're transferred knowing that in real time, so you can have real time interventions, but it really requires every single system to function in real time with data entry. And for data integration to happen periodically throughout the hour, um, 24 hours a day for it to be meaningful data. And so this has been a bit of a challenge in my opinion, in terms of getting everybody lined up, everybody reporting the data, everybody doing that in real time from hospital systems, which are massive and changing things like entering ADT data in the workflow of a, a nurse on a busy emergency room or a busy patient floor is very hard. Um, getting that data then fed in and out to all the pipes that it has to go through to get to that care manager at Melissa's organization's screen is, is not an easy thing to do from the beginning. Now, once it's there and in place and everybody's doing it, it's great. But we're in the...
in a get it together mode right now in North Carolina. It's not there, um, but it is definitely something we're striving for uh, because we know so much better in managing care uh, for people across this state. So I would just give that as another example of data. Uh, there are a lot of regional differences uh, in North Carolina right now at this time. Uh, some of our areas still don't have broadband technology. Uh, they're still on dial-up um, kind of, of access to the internet, if you will. The state is working diligently at increasing that broadband technology. We're still a ways out. And so it's going to take some time for care managers in some locations. They'll have to go back to a base office where there's good internet service to be able to upload information into the system. Um, it won't be as it is in some of the urban areas of North Carolina where, you know, internet is, is really good everywhere. Uh, that is just not true in Eastern North Carolina where I live and work and play uh, from the Virginia border to the South Carolina border out to the Atlantic Ocean. There's not great internet in most places. <laughs> uh, so again, the work in progress uh, and it'll be a challenge for us to get there. Um, so all of the IT systems within the tailored plans, within provider organization, within our clinically integrated networks, working to, to bring about data integration. I, I think one of the things I would add here in this state, and this would be true in other states that went in this direction, is a lot of providers don't have EHRs in North Carolina today. A lot of providers, frankly, are still using paper records. Uh, and we find this probably more in the IDD space than we do in behavioral health, frankly. Um, I'm not sure what that's about, but it's a reality here. And so where we have found that, uh, while there's clinically integrated networks that are available for providers to use as one solution towards moving towards care management, uh, Trillium as a health plan also offers the use of our platform to providers as a way of building that capacity and getting providers on board. Um, so I hope that helps, Doug. Any other questions on that? That makes a lot of sense and something you called it getting the data, getting, getting, getting it together mode, I think is the, the technical term. And, and with that, Melissa, as far as your uh, getting it together mode for what's happening now, what we're collecting, um, how we're getting the data together, uh, what's going on at Monarch um, when it comes to Monarch's get it together mode? So uh, thanks, Doug. So we're collecting everything. Uh, that's, the, <laughs> that's the short end of it. Um, but but just kind of give you a couple of examples of what we're doing is that one, we've in our outpatient offices across the state, we've also partnered with a pharmacy. Um, and that pharmacy looks at our data and tells us just simple things of when did that person pick up their medication? Did that person not pick up their medication? Um, and how can we, do we need to, uh, does the pharmacy need to deliver that medication so that they receive their medication because maybe they're having some transportation issues or they're limited in transportation? Um, depending on where they live. So we're, we're looking at that. The pharmacy gives us some really great data with that with, uh, so that we know about people's meds so then we know how frequently they're, they're getting those. Uh, we also work with our MCOs to get paid claims data. Um, but the, and that's great and we can look at the trends. But sometimes that data is dated, right? So that, that does present a barrier for us sometimes. One of the things that we're doing in more real time is where we have adopted um, a software called Bamboo Health and it's formerly known as Patient Pings in case you've heard of it. Um, so this system has partnered with several hospitals across North Carolina and they have the, they know how many, they know who we're serving as through the agency. So when someone goes to the hospital, uh, whether it's for a medical reason or for a behavioral health reason, that um, our staff get a ping. So our, we did this in the pilot. And so our care managers would get a ping to say, or a text to say, hey, your person you're supporting is in the hospital. So what that allows is, is that care manager can go out to the hospital and say, hey, you know, Susie, how are you doing? Are you okay? What's going on? Um, and that really going back to the seven day measures is that not only can we, the care managers allowed to see what was going on in real time and talk, and helping that person talk with their doctor at the hospital, but also after discharge, right? To make sure that they made those appointments after those seven days, whether it with their primary care or with the therapist or a psychiatrist. Um, we wanna make sure that that, that happens. And the other thing that uh, using this system allows to do is identify trends. 
So if we see that someone is using an ED for primary care, we needed to make sure our care managers would say, hey, let's, let's direct you to, to get a primary care instead of going to the ED. We would also notice trends that if someone was using, going to the ED once a month, uh, we could look at that too. And also because it gave us both the medical and the behavioral health reason, sometimes oftentimes those are tied together. Um, so we, it would also allow us to see the whole picture and that whole person um, as we've already talked about today. So that really, that whole integrated care approach was really to be able to see that was really helpful. And then just lastly is overview that we are, cho we've chosen Medicaid as our care management software. Um, we looked at a lot of different systems. We were using the one through our pilot um, and we, we looked at several, um, but one of the things we wanted to do um, and not go with even a, one that was being gonna be used by Taylor Care is because we are looking across this, we are uh, providing services across the state. We, and there are six MCOs, Taylor plans. We didn't want our staff to learn six different systems. Uh, we, we felt that there could be room for air. So we chose one plan. We saw Metasked, we thought it was fantastic. We fell in love with it. Um, and we said, this is the plan for us. It can get us that data that we need out of it. The reporting features in it is really, really great. And we're really excited about it because um, we need to be able to pull that information out as much as our care managers are going to be putting it in. So thanks, Doug. Oh, thank you. That was mm -hmm. really great. Uh, <laughs> and a uh, quick question for Cindy. Um, thinking about how these, this whole person supports, how they come together, integrating the physical health with the home and community-based services and social supports. Um, up until now, they've existed, but they've been kind of siloed sometimes. Um, what is the promise when it comes to behavioral health, as it behavior, when it comes to population health, uh, when it comes to whole person supports and, and putting together the physical model with the social model in, in this new way when this goes live in December? Yeah, so there's a there's a couple of things I would say. I, you know, when it when it comes to our IDD population, uh, one of the most exciting things I think for me is really starting to analyze the data about this population. What kind of healthcare are they? And so early on, as we we started going down this path, we uh, started looking at the data for uh, women with IDD that were at the age to receive. Um, just their first mammogram. And this is just, you know, based on they're at 40, they should get a mammogram, you know, in the next few years for baseline. Unless the, the individual lived in an intermediate care facility for intellectual disabilities, they weren't getting mammograms. <laughs> um, in fact, 95% of the women weren't getting mammograms uh, that unless they lived in one of those settings where that type of health care was regulated. And so they had to get them. And so um, in addition to that, uh, OBGYN exams like a pap smear, which helps prevent you know, cervical cancer uh, deaths and, and at least identify it early and get the treatment, um, pretty much non-existent unless they were in one of these more regulated uh, intermediate care facility settings. And so we saw that data. It was profound. Uh, we we actually ran it a couple of times. We just couldn't believe that there had been no paid claims. So these are certainly areas that that contribute to the the shorter longevity of life in this population. Um, for some of this population, maybe not even able to say to anyone that they have pain or concern um, or even know that before it's it's already taken their life. And so. We, we know here at Trillium, uh, even though the state is not currently requiring uh, those types of, of efforts on our part, we, as we get started, uh, we're going to be working through value-based purchasing arrangements with providers to really target getting those types of uh, exams for members. We do have a whole health measure, and that is that uh, individuals with IDD uh, have a physical exam once a year, uh, every year, and, and so in, in many cases, that's great, but it doesn't really address getting the mammogram or getting the pap smear or, or even prostate exams for men. And so these are all things that we do in preventive care. Most of the people probably listening to me talk here have gotten those types of exams in accordance with their health care. Um, but a lot of people with IDD don't. 
And so this is where it changes the game in healthcare for this population. Uh, it, it brings about, hopefully, uh, providers who are dedicated in, a, in the healthcare space to this type of integration. It may be that Trillium as a health plan targeting uh, the health and well-being of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities has, has OBGYNs in specific areas who really embrace working with the population of intellectually and developmentally disabled. Um, so that it's not just every OBGYN out there, but people who are specially trained and uh, very excited about working with this population. Um, we don't have that today, but it's something to look forward to over the next decade that as a health plan, we can get some synergy around uh, treating providers that really wanna help this population uh, live its best life and be, and be healthy. Thanks so much, Cindy. Um, and on that, the, the next question is for Deb and for DHHS that has helped make a lot of this possible uh, to, to bridge this, the physical with the social to make the data required, uh, and make it available. And when we think about uh, value-based purchasing arrangements and value-based payments. Uh, there's been for several administrations in Washington and also in North Carolina, um, a push towards value-based uh, purchasing arrangements. But when it comes to the actual uh, results on those, they've been a little bit beyond the, the short term. However, some of the steps being taken in North Carolina bring that closer to near term. Deb, can you uh, tell us a bit about some of the work that's going on and the vision for value-based purchasing arrangements in North Carolina. Sure, and, and Cindy mentioned it. Value-based purchasing is, is paying for health. It's not just paying for health care. Um, it, is, it is less in line with if you do a procedure, you get paid for a procedure. If you do a procedure again, you get paid again. Um, that's a perverse incentive to continue paying and receiving the same procedure over and over again. So value-based purchasing arrangements um, within the contract between the plan and the provider incentivizes the provider for the outcomes that are desired for by the plan. So if you want to make sure that your follow-up visit is scheduled by the provider, someone has their six month checkup, then you would incentivize the provider with, if you, you have X percentage of your individuals make their six month visit, then you will be paid Y. And that gives you an opportunity to um, motivate the provider and, and gives the provider that uh, ability to um, get their staff to reach out, the extra calls, the text messages to incentivize the individual to come in for that visit. Um, and it can go from incentivizing an outcome, incentive payments, um, all the way up to shared savings for that individual um, or gr that group of individuals or shared savings and shared risks. So the state has outlined a plan, a five-year plan for um, moving the plans through the incentive payments and the value-based purchasing that they're comfortable with to those more pay for performance um, arrangements uh, over five years. Um, it's a comprehensive, it's a comprehensive pathway to optimize our health care and our health and well-being for North Carolina's most vulnerable populations. Definitely. We also, um, I believe, is worth a mention is the managed care tool of value added services, which are outside of Medicaid, um, traditional Medicaid services. But the plans are able to offer these uh, to their members. Um, sometimes to incentivize the member. For example, we have uh, one of our plans is doing breast pumps. If you make your, um, uh, your first prenatal visit before 16 weeks is up. So get you in there, get the visit, better outcomes. Um, transportation, um, 
up to 12 rides to a non-Medicaid service, such as a grocery, a bank, um, a job-related activity, so that you are able to get some of those needs met um, that Medicaid wouldn't otherwise be able to pay for. Um, our, um, our plans are creative and, and they're looking out for their members for opportunities to, to help their members and incentivize their providers. That's it. I think creativity and looking out for people and helping them has been the theme of this transformation and also this panel. Um, and so with that, uh, it's time for our closing thoughts and our lessons learned so far. Um, and here we are recording this, it's July. We see you live in person in August, and then we go live in December. So there's probably lots of thoughts right now. Closing thoughts is probably not one of them, but that's what we're going to do now. And we're going to start with Cindy. Thanks, Doug. So uh, right now today in July, uh, as we record this, I have a, enough lessons learned that I could do a whole session just on that already. Um, so a couple of things, I'm also so fortunate to be a mom of children with developmental disabilities who access care from this system through our uh, C waiver, the innovations waiver here in this state. And, and one of the things I will say is North Carolina has done a good job of working with consumers, members, families, trying to get the word out about the change and the choice in care management. I think they've done an exceptional job of laying out the policy for how people can make choice um, it's still going to be hard because it's change, uh, and change is hard, and we all have to sort of acknowledge that um, as, as folks go through that. Um, I, I am excited. I, I do believe this system is a system that will help people like my children. Um, it certainly gives us a, a real different focus here at Trillium, uh, having a mom as the COO <laughs> uh, developing the, the health plan. Um, in, in terms of everything we do being very member centric. I will say that uh, consumer family voice in the process has to be there. Uh, they have to be listened to. It is so critical as part of the setup uh, and the follow through and then the evaluation of success should include the voices of the people served by the system that is created um, as to whether it's working or not working and then uh, make modifications where it isn't working. Same is true for providers. You have to listen to providers as they make this journey across this threshold into managed care, and doing care management and population health. Um, it's important to listen to them and, and to be a servant leader when it comes to um, transparency and trustworthiness in, in listening to those parties. Trillium can only be a successful health plan with successful partners. Uh, and, and we acknowledge that right out of the gate and are working really hard to incorporate all those members, all those providers as a part of our health plan for the future. Uh, so thank you so much, Doug, for the opportunity to share those couple lessons. Cindy, thanks for all that you're doing. Uh, absolutely. And uh, for closing thoughts from Melissa and Monarch. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, just like Cindy, we could do, we could talk all day about lessons learned. Um, with the pilot, one of the things that we learned first uh, off the bat, which we didn't expect, was uh, turnover happens. Uh, 30 days after launch, we had two of our team of care managers uh, turned over. So we were, we were surprised about that, didn't see that coming. So we had to, uh, so we immediately knew we needed to have a backup plan. So what, when, what if people leave? What, what happens when people go on PTO? We just needed to make sure that we had that plan early on. So when we hired people, we actually added a care manager to the team uh, with the MCO's blessing uh, as far as the pilot. And that has worked extremely well, actually, since May of last year when we had that turnover. We have not had any turnover since. We've had 100% retention. So we're really excited about that. Um, also making sure that those teams, you're, when you're building those teams with care managers, that, that they're diverse and they bring different strengths to the table is one of the things that, that we learned as well. Um, partnerships, partnerships and relationships with people, as well as partnerships with the community is something that we have learned um, wholeheartedly making sure that, and that's why our care managers are in the field as well as our peer. The peer, 
a lesson learned that we think we're so glad that the state has recognized those uh, North Carolina as to be extenders and to be part of that team. We think they're instrumental, especially with that lived experience and um, has been ha has been phenomenal in, in, in providing services to folks. Um, also, crisis management was something that we learned too. What happens after hours? Uh, what does that look like? What does an on-call look like? How do we, you know, we talked about earlier about the bamboo help. You know, what happens at three o'clock in the morning when someone's in the hospital? How to respond to that person quickly and efficiently without burning out the team was something that we really had to talk through and um, have some solutions along with that. Engagement is one thing that we learned too. We didn't think it, we knew it was gonna be challenging, but we, we didn't think the 30% expectation was gonna be difficult. And it was, um, we had to, you know, what happens when people don't have a phone? What happens when they move? What happens when we don't have their current addresses? What happens when they're in jail? Uh, were all things that we had to think about in order to try to engage with folks um, and define them to get that uh, so we can so we can engage with people because that's that's the number one thing is is finding to be able to work with folks. Um, one of the things that we realized too when you're getting up with folks if they're buying minutes that get up with them at the beginning of the month if you try to get up with them towards the end of the month they probably run out of minutes and you're not going to get them until after the first of the month. Um, just those little things putting into play, uh, we, we, we figured that out. Um, and, you know, that, and going back to that engagement, one of the things that we're excited to say is that our first cohort, you know, with their bumps and stuff today, they're running a 43% engagement rate, which we think is fantastic. Um, in preparedness, we do want to make sure that, you know, have a hiring plan. You have, you know, we're looking at, you know, fiscally, our capacity building funds that we're receiving as well as just the budget and making sure everything works within it. Looking at panel size and acuity be, to be able to serve folks. Um, our case care management software, of course, making sure you know demos and staff are, and how to train staff in that in a COVID environment, virtual versus in-person training, just one of those things you have to think through. Um, training plan for all of our staff. When we looked at all the state and the Taylor plan requirements to train people, it's an eight week training before someone can even start providing services. So putting that into our hiring and training plan was something that we really had to think through. Um, working with the state and the Taylor plans, making sure we're at the learning collaboratives, we're participating and we're asking questions and getting answers. Um, so, that's, so that's it. Thank you, Doug, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, and to pull it all together, we have Deb from DHHS. Uh, they get to see this from an entirely different angle, but is such an incredible partner in making it happen. Uh, and we have incredible partners to work with. And it you need that. You need the open communication. You need everybody to be on board. You have to be willing to pivot if something's not working the way that you want it to work. But between care management, the healthy opportunities pilot, value-based purchasing, value-added services. These are all tools that we never had before that we can utilize to get the best possible health and outcome for the people that we're all supporting. So I thank everyone for being here and working on that same goal. And so with that, um, I really want to thank this panel. You can see why this transformation uh, is going to be a success in North Carolina because of the passionate, experienced, uh, and incredibly dedicated people that are making it happen. Um, and uh, everyone will look exactly the same as this in a month from now because this is not stressful at all. Um, but <laughs> but, uh, but uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us, Cindy, Melissa, Deb, and for all the work that's going on. Uh, and and uh, hopefully, uh, thank you everyone for watching this this session and learning some of the lessons that we have uh, as we transform uh, the programs for the individuals that we support across North Carolina. So thanks everybody and have a good day. <laughs>